Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary. It's, it's an amazing thing, folks. This week, we're now to the shortest day of the year this week, right? Mm. Things are getting dark, right? <laughs> Sometimes when things get dark, your spirit gets lowered a little bit. We're going to talk about that in today's message, but uh, we have a light. The light shines to us. The shine, light shines from us. It's so important. I've got this little postcard on my hand. You know, you know Eric Briscoe, he comes and he preaches, the evangelist, and, uh, and he does our, what we call Vacation Bible School or Kids Club. He's so interesting. There's Eric going along. Eric's like 70 years old. Talk about an all-terrain vehicle, right? There he is. He's over at Boston University in this picture. He's at all these universities all this time, right? all to, in the warmer weather. But then you know what he does? You know, sometimes you think you're going to back off. It's winter. He says, nope, we're getting set to go down in the subways. He keeps bringing the gospel. So they got on the subway, so it's a little warmer. Isn't that cool? Isn't that tough? What, what, what? There's, the, there's an evangelist for you, folks. They just, they just don't stop. We're not all given that gift, but we're all given gifts, and we should use them. We really should. But welcome to Calvary. Uh, women's Bible Studies this week, uh, and please uh, avail yourself of that. You can jump online if you don't want to come to, to the building. I'd come to the building if I were you. If you, if you were going to come, I might even bake something for you. But just saying, I'm not bribing. I'm not bribing, but I will bribe. I'll come. You can come. Thank you. You'll be there. I'll bake you something, honey. Okay. Now, James 127. It's about caring for orphans, right? Pure and unpiled religion before God and the Father is to do this. Visit the orphans and the widows and in their trouble and keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's why you have the silly tree over in the corner, folks. It's for orphans. This is a reminder. I would implore you, I hope, coming through this Christmas season, that you will give to take care of orphans. Maybe you are already, but these are orphans. Look, I feel personally invested with them. And, and those of us who have gone to Costa Rica, you've seen them. You can see the pictures there. We'll go again. But as a church, we're called to care for orphans. So I'll tell you again, before you step by a lot of Christmas presents for everyone else, think of the orphans. Think of the orphans. So important for us to remember that. This afternoon, I don't know who can make it. I hope... If you can't make it, you do. We're going to go over to Lynn Gillis's place, okay? At 3.30, we're going to bring our little hymn books, uh, a little uh, Christmas, we're going to sing Christmas carols. A cappella, we're going to have some fun. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to read Luke chapter 1 and 2, whatever part of it we want. We'll all take turns reading it. We're going to have some cookies. Marta baked some cookies. You can bake some cookies. You can buy some cookies. I don't know. And we're just going to enjoy our time over there. There's a, there's a fellowship room there. And please avail yourself at 3.30. I'll give you the address at the end of service. It's a good time to go and do this. And so there's part of the presents that went to the foster children, folks. We have 20 foster children to supply things for. 20 of them got gifts. They got bags. Everything is laid out. There's more bags that came after that. So it's just a good thing. It's so good to give, to give to others. Because we get so much. We really do. You might feel like, oh, I don't got a lot. We have a lot, folks. Even sitting here, we have a lot. So uh, having said all that, I say this. Let's stand and sing praises and some special music today, too. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, a son is given. For unto us a child is born, a son is given. A son is given, the Messiah, oh, to see him, to see him high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 for unto us a child is born. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, a son is given, the Messiah. Oh, to see him, to see him high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. power and love as we sing holy 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 to us a child is born
special, special for you today. You can sit down. We have a special song, okay? Come on up. Come on up, ladies. Come on up. Special song. You know, when, when you go to the gospel, we go to Gospel of Luke, right? You see, it, 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 Christ was announced to all people, right? All people. So if you're going to go to all people, turns out you've got to go to all languages, right? It's not just here at in, in, in Calvary in this language. And we have many languages in this church. One of the things we're going to do is we're going to get, uh, there's something I want for the internet. Everyone who speaks different languages, I want to have you record it before saying something in your native tongue. But today, we have a really special Christmas special done by these ladies. Please enjoy.
Amen. That was pretty good, wasn't it? Uh huh. It was. We're gonna get all these microphones all straightened out up here and stuff. And uh, and Violet's gonna read our scripture today. But I did ask her to do it in English. I thought it would be a little bit, you know, more conducive to what I'm gonna say afterwards. So she's gonna read our scripture. And if we could get that first slide up there, please, gentlemen, I'd appreciate that. We're gonna be going from Christ, the hope of the world, and we're in Luke chapter two. Violet. Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 33. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took upon him in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelations to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled in those things which were spoken of him. Thank you, thank you. The kids going downstairs, have they escaped yet? Oh, they're going. You kitties can escape downstairs. You can run if you want, but you know. Whose kid is that anyways? <laughs> good morning. It's good to be here today. It's great to hear Christmas carols sung in another tongue, isn't it? It's just good. It just is. It's just you know, it, it helps us, and, and I do look forward to time. I, I'll be asking you, if I know you speak non-English, to be doing a recording of something for me, because it, it, it's amazing. There's not even a lot of us here today, but we probably have six languages that are spoke here. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. That's the way God's house should be, a mixed bag. Christ, the hope of the world. Christ, the hope of the world. Violette just read that text for us, and I thank her for that. She did a lot of work. She had to sing. She had to read. Put it to work today. But here's the scene, folks. Here's the scene that we've come to. Jesus was born, and Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, they're going to the temple to complete their obligations regarding a newborn male. That's what they're going to do. That's what they're going to do. It's been at least 40 days since the birth of Jesus. If you look at the law, purification laws, it would be 40 days before they went there. But it's required by the law. And they were doing for Jesus what was the custom of the law. We read it in the text. Now, a newborn child is special, right? But the actions of Mary and Joseph really aren't special. They're fulfilling an obligation. They're fulfilling an obligation. There's nothing special being done for Jesus that is not done for every newborn male child after about 40 days. And I think for a female, if I recall correctly, it's 66 days, but not that important. The point being is they were doing their obligation as they did this. Now, from a human perspective, think of it. It's like Jesus' first trip to the temple, right? I mean, it's kind of crazy. Yet we know, growing up, he went there many times. He even had a dialogue with the temple priests, <laughs> and they marveled at him. Of course, his whole life he went there as a male. He fulfilled his obligations to all the pilgrimage feasts and all the other events that took place there. So he was there quite often. And when he arrives, Simeon instantly recognized him. He took him up in his arms. Here's what I wonder. This is Pete's conjecture, so don't get mad at me. But remember, as I, we spoke last week, when, 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 when the child was born, the, the, the shepherds, right, they went to see the baby, and then they went throughout Bethlehem, and they announced the Christ child is born, right? Don't you just wonder? that the news didn't travel through the whole region, perhaps? Maybe they didn't know where Christ was, but maybe Simeon knew the Christ child was born. He didn't maybe know that it's Mary and Joseph, but maybe he just knew. I don't know. It's conjecture. 
But look at the Bible and look at don't look at it as such isolated incidents. These are integral things. You know what's going on downtown, uh, you know, there, except we just know things. Just a point to ponder, okay? But Jesus is the light. He is the light. Now, and I mentioned it in a little intro. Remember what did I say? I said, you know, we know that this is going to be the shortest week of the, you know, days of the, of the year, right? And it's a funny thing about that, okay? And that's regarding our mental health. Because sometimes the sun is very important for our mental health. Light is important for our mental health. General mental health is better in geographical areas with more light. I'm not making it up. You can look it up if you feel so. Just don't do it while I'm speaking. But, uh, and we know at this time of year, what happens? There's an upswing in depression and anxiety and suicides at this time of year. And what's commonly this is attributed to, and it took me a while to figure this out, like 66 years, okay? That was just, oh, the Christmas season, everyone gets upset. It's almost like Christmas is the reason people are upset. Wrong. Note when it is, the shortest time of the year, when people have their worst mental health. Okay, this is very, very true thing about this. For centuries, all over the world, cultures have had celebrations at the shortest time of the year. Again, I tell you, look it up. Always be willing to fact check me, folks. Always fact check me, okay? I don't have a problem with that. I really don't, okay? The lack of light was recognized for the impact it had on, on mental health. They didn't need to do a scientific study. <laughs> you just figured it out. It's all dark. We're all bummed out, right? What's it going to be like sunset, like 402 or something? I didn't even know today. It's just ridiculously early. But you know what? It was good medicine for those people to come together this time of year and celebrate. In all these cultures, it's good medicine for us to come together and celebrate at minimum once a week together as a called out assembly, okay? To celebrate, right? Because the, the earth was enshroud enshrouded in darkness this time of year. So socialization was a very, very healthy thing to do. It says in John 3.16, it says this, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because the deeds, deeds are evil. There's the other darkness, isn't it? Huh? It's not a light switch darkness. It's a darkness that we love, the darkness that humanity is literally drawn to. We're drawn to darkness. Darkness and evil are the absence of God. But darkness is what so many people pour themselves into, isn't it? Think about it. We pour ourselves. You, I hope we don't. I'll say humanity does. We can easily pour themselves into darkness. I can do it too. I get weak. Sorry. Sorry. Think of this for a moment. I was looking this up. There is at minimum 110 armed conflicts or wars going on on the earth right now. Did you know that? 110. War is dark. There's that many. It's not just in Ukraine and Israel, okay? Everywhere, people are dying. All ages. It's an amazing thing that goes on. Watching war on TV would never prepare us and never has for the darkness of war. We watch it on TV. It may as well be a video game. And I don't do video games, but we watch it on TV. It's a true thing. And think of people, the men and women that return from war, how scarred they are. I mean, the scarring of the things that they have seen and the things they've done, the things they may have done, it's horrific. Humanity knows war is darkness, but we love darkness, so we still have wars. Explain that to me. In World War II, okay, World War II, I was looking this up. World War II, six pilots took off from an aircraft carrier, okay, in the North Atlantic. And they, and they flew out on a mission to go look for enemy subs, German subs. They do their mission. They're flying around. Okay, It got dark, and they came back to land at the ship. Well, the captain of the ship got some intel in between. He got it, and he ordered blackout conditions on the aircraft carrier. Blackout conditions in the North Atlantic at night. The pilots are coming in. They know the general location. They requested that the flight deck lights go on. No. They desperately asked the, the flight deck lights go on. No. Six souls crashed into the darkness of the North Atlantic that night. Darkness. They had no guiding light to bring them in. They did not. They did not. That said, what does it mean to hope in Christ? How can we know that Christ is our all in all? It seems though Simeon had a good grasp on this. It really does to me. 
Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for the, your word today, Lord. I thank you for this example that Simeon was given to us, Lord. Someone that so often I have skipped over in my reading of your word. Yet his words that you've given him are power-packed with regards to the gospel. Well, thank you and praise you for this day, Lord, to be together, to simply share this time together. In your son's name, I pray and ask for guidance from your spirit. Amen. 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 We must recognize that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. That's what we need to do. Jesus asked his disciples just explicitly who he was in Matthew 16. He said to them, but who do you say I am? It's like looking in your eye. Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? That's what he was doing, right? That's what he was doing. And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Got it right. Everything hinges on answering that question correctly. Because if Jesus isn't who he says he is, okay, this is what Paul said about that. It's kind of interesting. In 1 Corinthians 15, 14. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is empty also. Ouch. Folks, you're wasting your time if Christ didn't rise. What are you doing here? <laughs> right? What do you listen to this preaching for? Think about it. There's no black and white left with that, isn't it? Right? It, it is black and white, rather. There's no gray. It's like, it is or it isn't. It is or it isn't. Paul also said, and he followed up on that further, he says, and if, dead, and if the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for, for, mark, for tomorrow we die. Right? So like, hey, if there's no resurrection, then just live it up. Paul just laid it out right there. I, as I always say, I can't understand why people act more or less like I do. Why do they pay taxes? Why do they only have one wife? Why don't we run around crazy? Because we're going to die tomorrow. Go for the gusco. But Paul laid it out that way, right? I'm just saying. That's what it says. If we recognize and trust Christ as God's salvation, we will live a life that is just and devout. In verse 25, what is enter Simeon. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Simeon was a man of faith, not of blind belief. He was not blind to what he was doing. There's a lot of blind belief out in the world, isn't there? People believe in the craziest things. People, I mean, I'm not people, people believe there's power in rocks and crystals. They do. I know if you get some rocks, that you, you, ukrainium, uh, ukrainium, <laughs> uranium in them, right? You can make a, a nuclear power plant. There's some power in that, but I don't want to hold on to uranium too much. Hope is faith that's directed to the future. Simeon's hope was in Christ, wasn't it? It was in Christ. Simeon was just. To be just or righteous means one's behavior in the sight of God towards others is in accordance with God's standards. I like to keep on finding new definitions for words. It always makes me think. I just, it just does every time. I don't like just one. I like them over and over. I like an assortment. I like an assortment, okay? Being just, being righteous. Humanity, think about this. Humanity follows God's standard, right? We do, until we love our darkness more, right? Everyone does what we should do until we find that God says, until we want something more. That's what we do. It's that simple. Something pushes me over the line of sin. Just saying, something does. I can't blame you. I might want to, right? You know why? Because we always want to deflect our guilt, don't we? <laughs> we just do. I just hate it. Def well, if, if those church people were better and they did what they did, you know, give me a break. That's just sin, just falling out of my mouth, okay? And sometimes I can think, or maybe you can think, I don't know, but I'm, remember, when I'm up here, I'm usually preaching to myself, okay? You, you, I'm just so transparent, folks. You, you must be used to my life, but you know what? I find mostly what I say, it hits all of us. It just does. You might think something like this. Well, I'm going to be generous in my giving. I have a lot, and it's easy for me to give, and that's cool. I have a lot, and it's easy for me to give. It really is. But. But what if the other scenario is there? I just don't have a, the patience to deal with that person. Do you notice a disconnect between that? I'm cool with giving my money, but I don't have the patience for these people over here. Huh. And I'm just picking on one thing here. I don't have the patience for them. 
Giving a lot with no pain is no sacrifice, right? It isn't. You got a lot, you give a lot. Big deal. I got two boats and a car. I don't. I have a car. I don't want a boat. But the point is, sometimes people give a lot. But being patient with that person, the hard one, that is sacrifice. It can be a real sacrifice to be patient with someone. That is when your faith is being tested. Not you, 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 got, you got money following your pockets, that's great. And I am glad you do. Give generously, don't care. But what about what's going to change that? That patience is so important to us. You know, Simeon was so obedient. He was moved when he was told to move, right? He was told to go to the temple that day by the Holy Spirit, and he did, right? If I am being moved, just do what I'm supposed to do, be patient. Sometimes I have to be patient. You have to be patient to do these things. And he was devout. Devout. What's devout? Devout means being reverent and careful regarding one's relationship to God. I just like the framing of it. Because people say, people, you know, they, they, they sometimes, you know I don't like being called reverend. I think I've made that clear because only God's revered. Okay? Call me pastor. Call me a good guy. You know? Call me up. Not late at night. But, uh, but you know, God is revered. That being devout, that's what it's all about. Okay? If you're at work sometimes, y'all know that you, 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 your supervisor, you, you, you may speak to your supervisor a little bit differently. Yes, no, maybe. I'll take care of that. There's a certain respect that we have. Yet sometimes we forget that God knows the thoughts and tents of our hearts continuously. He does. He does. How do we handle that situation, huh? Being just and devout are two words that are a lifetime process. That's what they are. It's not a one and done. It's a process that we need to enter into today if we have not. And it's not going to be easy because if you're willing to enter into that to being just or righteous and being devout, it's going to go on the rest of your life. There'll be some changes in your life. Live to please God. Living in sin is displeasing to God. Isn't it simple sometimes? Why do we make it so hard? We make it so hard. That's that fork in the road so obvious, right? Recognition that Jesus is the only way of salvation will impact your perspective on God's standards. God's standards. If we recognize and trust Christ as God's salvation, we will live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We certainly will. Three times in these verses, they're marked with Simeon's life being dependent on the Holy Spirit, right? Sometimes we get a little confused. Imagine that. We get confused, and what do we think? We think, well, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. Well, it did, but it came differently. Because we know if we go back to the very beginning, Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form and void. And darkness, darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, the deeps of the water, right? Right there in the beginning is the Spirit. God manifests his spirit from the beginning. Don't miss it. The spirit hovering over creation. Because creation didn't have it together yet. Right? I mean, you got to make your bed. It doesn't start off. Like you got to put it together. It's not made. It isn't. Creation was in darkness. The spirit enlightens darkness. Okay? And the war with darkness that we're all embroiled in, it's only, it's only going to be dealt with properly as it says in Galatians 5 and 16. I say then, walk in the spirit that you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's where the darkness comes. That's where it comes, the lust of the flesh. That's where it gets to. It, really, it just does. You think about it. Jesus, he was, remember he was speaking with Nicodemus? Great dialogue they had. What did he tell him? You must be born of water and of spirit. That's what he told him, of spirit. But just as the spirit was active in creation... So the Spirit is active in the creation of a new life when we're born again. Right? Isn't it cool? Salvation. Salvation puts together that which was broken, the broken relationship that we had with God. We're reconciled. The Holy Spirit was active in guiding the world well before the Holy Spirit was manifest at Pentecost. There just was. And that same Spirit guided Simeon to the temple that day to see the consolation of Israel. The same spirit that was there. If we recognize and trust Christ 
as God's salvation, you will view yourself as a servant, as a servant. In verse 29, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Your servant. That's Simeon's perspective. I'm your servant, okay? It had been revealed to Simeon by the Spirit that we would not see death until he saw the Christ. That's what God told him. That is not a trivial promise, folks. That's a pretty big promise, I'll tell you that. Don't skip over it. As a devout man in communion with God, he was given this promise. Good things come along with being just and devout, folks. It really does. A servant is someone that sets aside all of their rights to serve another. Isn't that what a servant does? Isn't that a reflection of love, right? Love has us seeking to do what's best for another person without any anticipation of anything in return. That's what love is. Love is an outpouring. I'm going to keep saying that at least every other week until we all understand this. Love is an outgo. It's not an ingo. That's just me getting what I want. That's all it is. Christ came to serve, not to be served. Correct? In verse 28, he took him up in his arms and blessed him. Can you think of that? This Simeon there, he takes the, I don't know what happened. You know what happens sometimes? There's new babies, right? Like, you know, usually you don't mess with someone's new baby, okay? The, the rule is if someone brings a new baby in the church, don't touch them, don't breathe them, and don't kiss them. That's the rule, folks. Don't ever miss that rule. Mama don't need you touching her baby, okay? They, she doesn't. I know you love them. Cool at them, but don't touch them. Don't put your lips on them. I know you, isn't it amazing? We, we desire to kiss babies so bad. The dirtiest thing in my, bo my body is my mouth just about, it's crazy. At any rate, he's got this baby up in his arms. He really does, okay? He really does. He has up in his arms. The baby's just 40 days out of the womb. It's the prophecy filled of Messiah. In Isaiah 7, 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. It's so cool. I love Emmanuel, God with us. I just love it. I like the sound of Emmanuel, and I like the meaning of Emmanuel. You know, we're never going to find peace like Simeon's and to become servants like Simeon. Simeon was ready to give his body over to God because God already had his spirit, didn't he? He already had his spirit. He already had his spirit. He wasn't worried about his body. Simeon was embracing death. No, he was not looking to die. The point being, he was freed from the fear of death completely. Completely. He was looking for the Christ child. Simeon experiences the consolation, which is the comfort, the encouragement, or the solace only found in Christ. And the baby's literally in his arms. It is, it's wild sometimes to think, this is how Messiah was introduced as a baby. Because, well, how was he going to come? He, he, he could have come down, right, like, in just form, but didn't. It made it tactile so we could actually relate to it. That's how God brought this all about. And he's speaking to Israel here. And speaking to Israel here, in the book of Hebrews, what the writer says in, in Hebrews 6, 17, he says, Thus God determined to show abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immu immutability, his unchangeability of his counsel, confirmed by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which, okay, it's impossible for God to lie, and then we get to it, we might have strong consolation who have fled for the refuge and laid, hope of, laid hold of the hope before us. Laying hold of the hope before us. That's where our refuge is, our protection. That's where it is, okay? Hope. The biblical definition of hope. The sure and confident expectation of receiving what God has promised us. That's what hope is. You believe he's promised it. You believe it. It's not a wish. You know, wish upon a star, get it in a pickle jar. I don't know. It's not a wish. It isn't. It's a hope. It's a desire. It's a something that comes from your heart. You're believing in it, and it's a focal point, and it, and it drives your life. It puts you this way or that way, wherever way you're supposed to be going. That's what hope does. We need to flee to the refuge and lay hold of the hope that's set before us. Who else are we going to hold on to besides Christ, right? Your rock collection, the crystals? 
Right? Is that where the power is going to come from? Now, Simeon had a great song of praise. He had a song of praise in this. It's there for what God was doing. Sats in verse 29. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your, Lord, of, of your people Israel. Simeon saw God's salvation not as anything that he had done. Remember? He was not at the temple. He was in the temple that day because, at the direction of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't even going to go, maybe. He was going to go someplace else. I don't know. But it says he was brought there by the Holy Spirit. You know what we say at times, folks? That's what we say at times. Something happens and you say, you know what? I had a feeling that was going to happen. That's not a bad thing. I usually I dump on feelings because our feelings change a lot. But so, I, I had a feeling about that. Well, maybe the next time that happens, maybe you should investigate it. Maybe give it a little bit of thought. Oh, that feeling, that thing that happened, maybe that was God working in my life. Maybe that was the actual action of the Holy Spirit directing you or I to go do something. So okay. Feelings, they, they can be okay. We, we, need to, we need to look at them closely. Holy Spirit working in you. The birth of Jesus Christ was a light to the world, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Simeon was illuminated. Simeon's statement, the statement that he made would have shocked any Jew that was in earshot at the temple. Remember, Mary and Joseph come in with Jesus. They're, in the, they're at the temple on the temple grounds. Exact location, we don't know. They're at the temple. Whatever that means, that's where they are, okay? Think of what Simeon says, what he said, what he just said, and think what Israel was at this point in history. Israel's become very self-focused. They have. That's, that's not to be cruel. That's not to be mean. I can relate to being self-focused and wrong about it sometimes, Okay? But what were they thinking? The Gentile world is bad. They were right. The Gentile world was bad. It was idolatrous, folks. Idolatry is bad. Think it through. They're God's people, chosen people. And they didn't want to be associated with idolatry, nor should we. Do we ever think, do we ever think that the world outside of God's plan is good? Think of that for a while. Do you ever think the world outside of God's plan is good? It's kind of a weird thought process. Think it through sometimes. I wrestle with that because I see things that are really good. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. But isn't being self-focused a snap for us? Right? Isn't it? Our pain at times, my pain at times, I come very so self, so self-focused on it. I throw me a, a, a pity pity party. Pity parties are really easy to throw for yourself, aren't they? Aren't they? Y'all know it because y'all do it because you're just like me. You're a bunch of sinners. That's what you are. It is. Remember Paul? Paul was afflicted with a malady. We don't know what it was. And three times he asked for it to remove. It never was. It never was. And think of his ministry. This guy was an all-terrain vehicle. He went where he had to go. He didn't make any difference. Throw him in the ocean, bite him with a snake, stone him. Didn't, he kept going. It's not like us. We, <laughs> okay, I make fun of SUV uh, drivers just because it's what I do. Sorry, I know most everyone here has an SUV. That's okay. I think I give it up. But we drive our SUVs, right? They're really cute and pretty, but don't let it get dirty, right? When's the last time you seen an SUV with mud up on its sides all dirty? Paul was an all-terrain vehicle. He was dirty. He was down in the dirt. And that's what ministry needs to be, down in the dirt. We need to get dirty, folks. That's what ministry is, getting into people's lives, bringing them out of that dirt into the glorious light of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. Simeon stated that God's salvation is to all people, not to Jews. Whoa. That's the same message that was delivered by the angel to the shepherds, right? I bring you tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. All people. That's why we sang this song in another language. Always keep that in mind, to all people. There's people in Switzerland singing the same song or wherever you want to. It's amazing. I love it when, I get, when we get... Uh, get little uh, YouTube clips, and I've got to send them out more often, or someone can help me, of uh, uh, Global Baptist Training Foundation, when they're in different parts of Africa, and there's people singing songs, uh, uh, same songs we sing, no music, just clapping hands, and just getting down to it. It's amazing. Same song, same God, same God. 
And verse 32, the first half of it, it says, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Remember, he's saying this in the temple grounds. Think about it. He's saying this in the temple grounds. This is bold stuff. In Acts 26, verse 23, this is Paul. Paul said that Christ should suffer, that he would be the first ray, ri to rise from the dead and would proclaim a light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. That's what Paul was writing about Christ, right? Christ had no delineation between any groups. He did not. That's why Simeon saying this at the temple grounds, his boldness is unparalleled. It really is. We discussed this Thursday night. Uh, we were talking, of, we're talking about all the different ways that Christ is king, right? And we talked on Thursday night how uh, Jesus Christ was a countercultural king, and he was. He ate with sinners. Rabbis did not eat with sinners, okay? He ministered to Gentiles. Remember the Canaanite woman up in Tyre? She was basically arguing back and forth with Jesus because her daughter was sick, right? And in the end, he healed her. He showed mercy around every single corner Jesus went. He was so countercultural, wasn't he? I could go on with that list. It's so long, okay? It's amazing. So Simeon was countercultural too in his actions and his words. A revelation to the Gentiles? Are you for real? That's what he's doing in the temple, making this declamation. I mean, you could easily see the people in the temple because they want to be insulated, and it happens in churches too today. Who cares about those Gentiles outside? Same things happen in churches. They become so insulated. Well, here, who cares about those people over there? They're sinners. They aren't like us. Ah, you got it wrong. I'm a sinner. I just happen to know it and admit it. <laughs> it's crazy when you think about it, right? We are, you're here because you know you're a sinner, and you need grace, and it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's a recognition. I know I'm a hypocrite. It's great. People are going to call me a hypocrite and say, amen, you got it right. I am. You win. I lose. Perhaps being about a devout man was the only thing that protected Simeon when he was making these statements. I don't know. But one thing Simeon was about was in Psalm 37:25. And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. Do you see his single focus? That's all Simeon was about, right? He's waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was pumped, and it's happening. All he desired was God. All, you know what? When you say that, people think, what about everything else? Everything else will take care of itself, folks. If you have a to-do list at work, right, you start with number one. Prioritize it correct. You know what happens? Every business... Every business school, I don't care if it's Harvard, MIT, Princeton, Yale, you know what they'll tell you? Everything else will take care of itself. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very simple management tool. Take care of the primary. Take care of our focus on God. Everything else will take care of, its play. It'll take care of itself. It will. It does every time. This is the moment he waited for. And in Colossians 3.11, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythians, slave or free. But Christ is all and in all. Is all and in all. Isn't that a cool statement, isn't it? Is Christ our all in all? Huh? Can you sing that song? You know the one? You are my all in all. Can you sing it and believe it? I love that song. I love that song. And then he says in the second half of 32, and the glory to your people of Israel. That's what he said to them. In Isaiah 46, in verse 5 and 6, God says that uh, he created the heavens. He stretched them out before everyone. He brought forth the earth. He gives breath to all the people and the spirit to those who are walking on it. And he says in verse 6, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. God had called him in righteousness, and I will hold your hand. Isn't that an amazing statement? Isn't that what you do with the child? You hold their hands, right, the little ones? until they're responsible, you got to hold their hands. If you're walking on Needham Street, you better hold their hands because the cars go banging up that street. And I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. What a statement, huh? What a glorious privilege is it to be the light to the world, isn't it? Do we think that way? Because God told Israel that directly, that they were lights. Israel's glory is Simeon's glory, a light to the world. And in Ephesians 5, 8, 
For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. It's written to us. It doesn't change, doesn't it? The Bible's a continuum, folks. It's a continuum. It starts off really hard, and it just gets better and better as you go through it. It just does. Are we guiding lights? Are we lighting the flight deck for anyone so that they can have a safe landing? Right? Have a safe landing. Because God's light is in us. You think about it. In verse 33, it said that, Mary and, that Joseph and his mother marveled at the things that were spoken of them. Could you imagine you're in the temple grounds? This guy, Simeon, he's just and devout. He's grabbed your child, right? He's like holding the child up, right? This is, this is an amazing thing. This is the Christ child. Who knows what else he said? Remember, I, that's, look it, I'm not a heretic. I don't mean it, but I think there's a lot more said than what we have in the Bible. I'm just telling you. I've talked a lot more than, than, than was written in the scripture, right? Do you think that they didn't? And he's holding this child up, and he's doing this. Could you marry Mary, Mary and Joseph? This is all happening on your child. You know what you're doing? Maybe you're excited. Then you go, wait a sec. Uh, there's a crowd forming. <laughs> What's going to happen, right? I'm, think about it. Look at the reality of what happens with humanity. You draw a crowd sometimes. Simeon didn't care. He was all into it. I, just, I find it an exciting, exciting scene when you go there. And if Christ is the hope of the world, and he is, are we willing to be at the center of that scene? Are we willing to be at the center of the scene? Are we lights? Are we lights? Simeon was a man of faith, not of blind belief, not at all. As I said, there's a lot of blind belief in this world, isn't there? A whole lot of it. Hope is faith that's directed at the future. Simeon's hope was in Christ. Hope again, same definition. Not going to change it this week. It's a sure and confident expectation of receiving what God has promised us. Is Christ really our consolation, our comfort, our encouragement, our hope of eternity? Is Christ that? in our lives? Folks, we don't have to go to the temple to get hope or give hope, right? Temple's gone. Just that one wailing wall's left, right? In 1 Corinthians 6.19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Folks, wherever we go, we bring the hope of Christ to that place. What should we do? We should do justice. We need to be devout and be hope in a dark world. If not you, who? If not now, when? We have Christ in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day, Lord. I thank you for this message. I thank you that you included this man, Simeon, in your word, Father. Simeon, he had so many things to say, so much more he had to say that we couldn't touch on just this morning. I pray for each and every one person here, Lord, that we remember that we are lights. We might not feel special, but in you, we are special, Lord, because you are in us. Let our, sh our light shine forth, particularly in this Christmas season, Lord, the time where uh, a lot of barriers come down. I thank you and praise you for this time, Lord, for my brothers and sisters that are here. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Light, could you just uh, hit those baskets, send them down either side? Because I'm certain there's a lot of gold and silver that's got to go in there. Silver and gold, just like the Rudolph thing, right? Silver and gold. Hey, so I just wanted to, so that, that'll go on there. And so our offering's taking place. So two last pieces of business that I want to remind you about. One. I'm sorry, Joe. I went out. Of, I went out of order. We get. I was supposed to do it after the last song. Why don't I? Why don't we do it the way I said, huh? We'll do our closing song. Then I'll have two more things to tell us. How's that? So please, <laughs> sorry, Joanna. <laughs> please stand and join us in song. <laughs> Please sing, 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 
all the plains and the mountains in reply. 